Hawaii, who will tell us about her excellent expedition to the eclipse. So like uh, uh, the previous uh, speakers, it was really a fantastic experience. Uh, in my talk, I will concentrate mostly on the science uh, from the eclipses and basically to try to, to, uh, uh, to give you uh, an idea of why we even bother to, do, uh, to go to eclipses because it's a lot of work and uh, a tremendous amount of effort. Uh, so the, the team, uh, uh, that now uh, Matt Penn I think uh, uh, talked about why we, we still uh, go to eclipses. Uh, from space we have a slew of, of uh, spacecraft that observe the sun. This picture is in the extreme ultraviolet, and you can see both the disk of the sun and a little bit off the edge of the sun and uh, of the corona in the ultraviolet. But you really have uh, you have a huge gap if you go to the coronagraphs. The, the best operating coronagraphs is still the Lasco C2, and you can see that this gap can only be covered by a total solar eclipse image. Now this is very important because it is precisely from the solar surface out to a few solar radii where the magnetic field of the plasma and the plasma undergo the most dramatic changes. And uh, so if we want to establish, know anything about how the sun expands into, into outer space, we need to really look at the physics going on in this part of, of, uh, of, of the corona. So what we do is we look at the visible part of the spectrum and there's an advantage to what we call the coronal forbidden lines in the, in the sense that the emission from these lines is produced primarily by radiative excitation and therefore it, it varies as the density of the ions, not the density square. So it extends much further away from the sun than the extreme ultraviolet. This is a composite from 2008, uh, just to, because I'm just giving a brief introduction. Uh, the green is from uh, the iron 14 line that has a peak ionization temperature at 2 million degrees, and the red is from iron 11 that has a peak ionization temperature of, of a million degrees. And this was in August 2008, it was around solar minimum, and you can see the distribution of the electron temperature in the corona from just observing these two lines. So you can get a very nice uh, uh, piece of information without doing uh, much. You just uh, get very, very uh, excellent quality data. Now there's another uh, important aspect to this uh, picture is that we have found since then, uh, we've been doing this for uh, uh, several decades now, is that the prominences, which are the coolest material in the corona, are invariably enshrouded by the hottest material there. So this is something that I will return to later on to, to, uh, in my talk. The other uh, important thing that we can capture with eclipses is uh, also this was uh, kind of rare and unusual, but in 2012 and 2013, there was a coronal mass ejection that was, uh, uh, that, that two of them actually here, the top one here that's in the, in the rectangle, this one, and on the right is an eclipse, uh, this is an eclipse image, this is a, 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 blow, uh, a high resolution image that shows you how the, the prominent material is intricately linked to the large scale structures in the corona. Okay, so what we did in uh, 2015, and uh, I'm, I'm talking about it because we got some uh, novel results, is we designed and built a, a dual, dual channel spectrometer that operated in a high, high order. And uh, this was a design by uh, Professor uh, Ding, who, who was working with me. And uh, so there were two channels, one centered around the Iron 11 line and the other one around the Iron 14 line. And we had a camera here on the side that would take an image of the slit with, in addition to the corona so that you could see exactly where you were pointing at. So one of the, the highlights were of this experiment, and this was from Svalbard, is to, uh, to find that actually the prominence material that I mentioned, uh, it just so happened that there was a CME that went through the corona. And uh, when, when a CME is triggered by a prominence that kind of uh, explodes or, uh, and escapes from the sun, uh, the question always was, what happens to this cool material? And this was the first time that we actually captured bits of these cool inclusions scattered uh, in a in a large, large region of the corona. So
So this is what the data shows. Uh, this is uh, the slit here. And you can see when we were above the promise, we saw uh, cool lines, and then when the slit was further away from the sun. So the upshot of, the, of these observations of 2015 is to produce a map of the corona, uh, a map of the CME front. And everything that has a red boundary has promise material inside it. The rest is hot iron 14. So we found speeds of 1,500 kilometers per second, blue, uh, red shifted going away from the observer. Now, just recall that uh, this uh, kind of now makes sense because we know that the prominences are always surrounded by the hottest material of the corona. So now I move on to 2017. We uh, decided because of uh, the eclipse that spans such a high, la a large landmass, uh, the best I could afford was with the funding I got was five observing sites. So we have uh, we had about 35 uh, people, uh, the solar wind Sherpas, uh, who were involved, and these are our observing sites. Uh, which covers about uh, the extent, the span was 1,200 miles, starting from Oregon all the way to Nebraska. And uh, these are the three types of instruments we had. So we have these uh, uh, cameras with the, the special filters to observe in these iron lines. Uh, this is the spectrometer, and this is, uh, this, these are the white light uh, cameras that we used. So we had almost identical instrumentation at the, at the, uh, at the five sites. Uh, this is a specially designed and uh, built tent uh, so that we, uh, uh, to protect the equipment and also to keep everything cool, we have an air conditioner that's attached to the tent. And you can see that you can unzip the plastic just before totality so that you, uh, so we can track the sun and then we unzip the, the roof and, and we can observe. So we've been doing this for a long time, but this was, uh, we had to special design it because of the sun. So this is our uh, signature white light image from one of the observing sites. All of them have equal quality images. And you can see uh, this, uh, other people have presented it earlier. The extent of the details in the corona are, are astounding. Again, we are close to solar minimum. Now from iron 14, which is at 2 million degrees, this is what we obtained. So again, you can see uh, the details of the coronal structures at the 2 million degrees. So uh, remember that what you see in white light is all scattered from electrons, so it's everything in the corona. But when you focus on individual uh, wavelengths, then you see exactly the different temperature uh, lines, uh, what, what the different temperatures, uh, plasma temperatures in the corona. Uh, this is our iron 11 uh, picture, and you can see that it's very different from iron 14. I'll go back to iron 14 so that you can see the difference. Of course, here you see that the, uh, all the, the polar regions are uh, dominated by iron 11. And um, uh, this was the first image ever of argon 10. We really wanted to try a new element and argon uh, has uh, lines in the visible. Uh, now you can, uh, you notice that it's very weak emission. And uh, I think our interpretation is because the coronal abundance of argon is very low. We know that uh, the corona is very rich in iron lines, but here we wanted to explore other elements and we found that argon is actually indeed very low. This is a composite of, the, uh, of our white light, uh, iron 11 and iron 14, and this gives you a very nice uh, idea of the distribution of the different temperatures uh, of the plasma in the corona. And as we have found from past uh, eclipses, uh, really there are, it seems to be the temperature is bimodal in the sense that it's uh, uh, either at, uh, dominated by a million degree plasma that's streaming away from the sun and everything that's bound to the sun is at the two million degrees. Okay, so uh, then for this eclipse we enhanced, uh, we extended our design of the two channel spectrometer to three channels. And uh, so uh, this shows uh, where uh, for the, the example I'm going to show you, this is, uh, we had uh, uh, three spectrometers who were looking at the east limb of the sun and one at the west limb. Uh, this example is just from the east limb and you can, I'm just pointing to the, uh, to the uh, complexity of the coronal structures in, at this part in the corona where we ended up having our slit. And you can see that if you look at the corresponding EUV images, you really lose, uh, you don't have any of this information that you have in the eclipse image. 
So this is the position, one of the slit positions. We started at the at the solar uh, at the on the disc, and then we the slit was uh, uh, scanning outwards. And what we found is this beautiful front in in H alpha that had H alpha emission, and you can also see helium emission and uh, uh, several helium lines. So this was another example, uh, even more pronounced than the 2015 example, where you have a, a, a huge uh, front of the CME that's, that's glowing in H alpha. So basically we have cool material that again was ejected uh, from the sun from a prominence. And by looking at the LASCO images, we can, could tell where there was actually a CME that, that was, had gone off uh, uh, you know, below the occulter. And it was really that CME that we, uh, we captured. Now, uh, from the eclipse observations, the speed was, uh, the, the emission was uh, Doppler blue shifted, and we got a speed of 670 kilometers per second. In the LASCO C2, uh, the speed was 268 kilometers per second in the plane of the sky. So we could derive uh, actually the angle at which uh, the, the CME was going, and the speed was around 700 kilometers per second. So in closing, I'd like to thank in particular Lika Gohatakurta because of her vision in creating the NASA Eclipse program that funded uh, our work. And all the uh, solar wind Sherpas who have been working uh, on uh, the Eclipse expeditions and uh, the ones who contributed to the 2017. And we uh, literally operated on a shoestring budget to make this happen. Thank you. appreciate these absolutely beautiful data and the work and the work that you are doing and we have time for a couple of questions. Lika? So Shadia, you kind of showed the red and green line and said that the um, indication is that the temperature is sort of binary, right? Uh, high or low. Uh, if you, I mean, do you think this is just a function of two filters that you are representing? Because if you look at SDO, you know, with nine or ten filters, it, it's uh, very multi-variant, so it's a question. Yes, uh, so with the SDO, what you can capture is really the, uh, the emission very, very close to the sun. Now, in 2010, we had seven uh, wavelengths. So we did see slight variations in the distribution of the electron temperature, but really the dominant ones are the 1 million and the 2 million. So those are the ones that persist, uh, and they vary as a function of solar cycle. Dr. Hudson? Yeah, normally for the coronal holes, for the open field, people talk about temperatures quite a bit lower than 1 million degrees. Yes, but that is... Uh, Okay, so uh, the, what's published in the literature really comes from very low down in the corona. Not at these distances, no. The distances, you cannot, you cannot get to these distances from other observations. Uh, what is the temperature of the argon? Uh, it's around... Dr. Uh, Mr. Kendrinak has asked for the temperature of the argon. It's, uh, it's around a million degrees. The argon-10 is an unusual yes. sighting. And the last paper in the session 